I feel quite honored to be on this forum. It has developed into a major event because the previous two presenters, they are two of the gurus in amplifier design, and I'm presenting after them. And the third one is right here in the corner, Professor Paul Tasca. <laughs> so it's a bit inconvenient, to be honest. <laughs> uh, and in, uh, I will show you a sequence of real design. Uh, hopefully there is something new for you there, something to improve your idea how to design uh, power amplifiers. And most of what is there comes from Steve Cripps and Peter Abri. That's how it is. Uh, it's also a collaboration work. Uh, I started this between two jobs to entertain myself. Malcolm provided a computer and microwave office, and then at the end of the day, changed my Bulgarian English to a more palatable English, uh, <laughs> and a few other ideas. Uh, Larry provided models for the transistors and the library of the passive components, and then at Modelitics they built the actual unit and tested it, and some of the results presented come straight from them. Some great work there was done. Okay, but uh, if we go forward, so to st a real thing we are designing here, and I decided that the requirement will be we are using the strike and 30 watt transistor gallium nitride. Uh, we want to achieve at least 25 watt in the bandwidth relatively broad band, 1.8 to 2.2 gigahertz, with maximum power efficiency at 25 watt. The software design tools we're going to use, this is first, there's a nonlinear model uh, of the transistor, which Modelitics uh, provide all of them for Triquant Corvo now. Microwave office was used, uh, Amplifier Design Wizard, and again Modelitics Passive LAMP Component Models Library. So the real crux of the design is based on this nonlinear model where we have access to voltage and current at the intrinsic generator, at the channel of the transistor. Uh, the passive part of the model here contains even the output uh, capacitor CDS of the transistor. Uh, when we have access to this voltage and current, we can see the load line, we can see the impedances at the intrinsic generator for the fundamental and the harmonics. So first microwave office is used uh, at a single frequency across the band. Uh, first thing we use microwave office is to kind of define a near optimum load line and then the impedances for the fundamental, which is the near <laughs> optimum load line anyway, and the harmonic impedances also. And then uh, we're extracting load pool. Uh, from the load pool simulations, we're extracting regions on the Smith chart to which we want to match to achieve the, uh, the required uh, specification. Uh, the synthesis of the matching network is done in the Amplified Design Wizard, about which we were just uh, listening. Uh, and the design task is uh, complete after in the microwave office where we have the accurate linear and nonlinear EM simulation, fine tuning optimization, and the uh, last is the layout export. Layout, uh, the amplified design wizard. Okay, it does the real frequency synthesis of matching networks, which means improper impedances can be specified, and this is already real world. Um, and the synthesis could be done simultaneously from fundamental and harmonics across a wide bandwidth. It's a real-world synthesis. Peter already just explained. Mixed microstrip and lamp component networks. Microstrip is continued to taken in account. Full lamp component models taken in account. Automatic layout generation and manipulation, which greatly increases efficiency of the design. Uh, including on time and creativity. So the Modelitics uh, passive components are also used. 
modalities provide these accurate scalable models across different substrates and soldering pad sizes. It's enormous selection of components and that provides confidence for the final design that we're going to have a first time right design. The design process, we start with this schematic. There is the nonlinear transistor, two tuners. Uh, the first things to do is to buy the transistor and to stabilize it. For me, playing around with the transistor of load pool or tuning it without stabilizing it doesn't make sense at all. So what happens next is this so-called near optimum load line tuning as a beginning. Of course, we generate the IV curves. And before I go to what's happening here on this diagram, let's start backwards. The harmonic impedance is the output, output tuner, and the, all the impedances of the input tuner are at 50 ohm at the beginning. The simulator is forced to work only with fundamental. Uh, the harmonic balance is just forced to do just the fundamental. The dynamic load line will be seen because we were uh, looking at, uh, uh, well, I have to go backwards, but uh, the voltage and uh, current at the intrinsic generator. And <laughs> what happens here is first, you can draw a near optimum line for maximum voltage and current swing. Doesn't need to be too accurate, and it cannot be. And then at some power level, we produce with tuning, you can see here the faded line was one of the op uh, when you start tuning and then you tune to a straight line to be parallel to the to that line, because uh, basically between class A, class B, and class AB, the load line for maximum power on the fundamental is about the same. Or sometimes you can claim mathematically it's the same. So we tune the the fundamental to be near optimum. Then we tune the second and the first harmonic to be, let's say, for class F. Second harmonic is short, first harmonic is open. Here you can see where the fundamental is a dead intrinsic. It's obviously uh, pure resistance. <laughs> okay, the input is matched to S11 to give you gain. And the harmonic impedance is at the input tuner at 50 ohm. So we ignore the, imp the influence of the harmonic cell uh, impedances on the input. Now, if we do a simulation with three harmonics now, not just the, the way the output tuner is tuned, with, uh, not just with the fundamental, we see a very typical class F dynamic load line and current and voltage waveforms. Now, we need to start load pool extraction for this frequency. Why? We need to see the impedance on the output, not that we don't know the optimum one, but we need to see areas. And what we do is we force first the load pool to provide us maximum power contours. Then we do it for maximum efficiency contours. Uh, and the same schematics is basically used, but I always put this XDB, which means at each frequency the power is swept. Uh, I want to emphasize that I don't understand how load pool contours could be done with constant input power. They always have to be swept because the contour has to be constant power only, not involving gain. Otherwise, it's mixed between gain and power, uh, and it becomes a bit not quite what it is. In deep compression, maybe it works. But if you want to figure out, let's say, amplifier you want P1 dB, then the contour could be very misleading if you, don't, if you do it with constant input power. You should look for uh, the contour have to be at compression point and then at constant power. So this is how it is done for this frequency. And what happens is you see two graphs which are quite distinctly different for, ma for maximum power and maximum efficiency. Uh, I still want someone to mathematically explain this to me. <laughs> Here I'm just working with low pool contours. Uh, and the graph on the right, the, the two are superimposed, and I'm putting a circle here that I want to extract to the amplifier design wizard for the matching in this circle inside is, I have chosen 1 dB below maximum power and 5 dB, 5% below maximum efficiency. Uh, 
Uh, in version 12, this is done automatically. You don't need to put the circle. You just need to see a requirement, and the contour is there. Uh, this was still version 11. So the next step is to run load pool for the harmonics. So the second harmonic load pool is run. Uh, and it is run at impedances for uh, P max and for maximum drain efficiency. And the graph shows that they superimpose these two results. And you can see that the optimum in both cases is exactly the same. There is very slight difference in the other graphs. Uh, and we choose here that we want our second harmonic to be in this area below the line that is drawn here. Same is done for the third harmonic. Uh, the optimum maximum efficiency is again at the same point, but the contour somewhat differ. But the effect of the third harmonic is quite less than the second. And you can easily select where you want to be. In this case, it's above this line. Of course, we are doing broadband amplifiers, so we have to do this in a few frequencies, so 1.2 and 2. gigahertz. So what happens here is this is a more streamlined method when you do the load, the, the tuning, the preliminary tuning for the fundamental and uh, harmonic impedance at the intrinsic uh, generator. Otherwise, if it was a black box, you have to do, let's say, load pool for the fundamental, the harmonics at 50 ohm. Now we have to do it for the harmonics. Now we have to do back for the fundamental. Well, maybe now we have to do again for the harmonics and maybe uh, quite a few iterations before you may think and feel that you had the optimum, but actually you never know and you don't even know what the uh, waveforms are to know the mode of operation or anything like this. So it's a bit of a... so. That method, this is the method actually here. It shortens and streamlines the extraction of the data to design this uh, amplifier using originally load, load, load line and uh, harmonic tuning at the intrinsic generator, which is kind of all Steve, Steve Cripps if you want to <laughs> look at it this way. Uh, then we go to uh, Amplify Design Wizard, and Peter Abley just explained. You put here the fundamental, uh, it's in circles actually. The second and the third harmonic, which are areas uh, more or less on the outside of the Smith chart, though you can go in with some uh, Q, defining Q and Z at different regions of the Smith chart. Uh, you need to read this how it's done. And then we start synthesizing, and this is what we came up with. It is a mixed um, solution here between lumped and uh, distributed. And with a bit of modification, actually, these uh, open stops were transformed back to into capacitors. Uh, biasing, decoupling capacitors were added, a bit of twisting around for more compact design, of course. And if you look at the simulation, the load fundamental is inside the circles. They, these circles are more or less on top of each other for the whole frequency. Uh, where is the mouse? <laughs> this is the, the green line here is the second harmonic impedance provided, which is where we want it. We want it to be in the more or less lower part of the Smith chart. And the third harmonic impedance is right there. We want it up there, so it's up there. Uh, and then we continue into microwave office with a few clicks of the mouse. This thing is exported. I just want to tell you how much productivity you, it's involved here. They were in the previous thing. Uh, where, where did it go? These are probably 19 components. This in a schematic form is probably 70. So imagine dragging 70, which just happened automatically for you otherwise. Because there is so many things to, you know, T junctions, uh, cross junctions, steps, uh, uh, via holes with uh, God knows how presented with so many components and so on. So that's a serious improvement in, uh, in this process of productivity. Um, so the lamp components were replaced by modelitic models. All the now simulations were done. 
uh, this design process typically eliminates necessity for optimization in microwave office. Just slight tweaking. The final layout you can see, performance you can see. This is the power at about 46 dBm. Efficiency is above 60 percent. That deep I cannot explain ever. And there is compressed gain and a small signal gain in input return loss. Uh, yeah. So the graphs below show the intrinsic low line voltage simulated the way it was designed at three frequencies. And I can say that this looks like the so-called extended continuous class F mode. There is a reference here. Paul Tusk and Steve Cripps names sit at the back there. You ask them for they to explain it better to you. <laughs> So, uh, at Modelytics, they produced uh, this stage, which you can see in the photo here. Uh, so, general comparison between achieved results. Uh, power is where it's supposed to be, gain is supposed, efficiency is not quite exactly where we wanted it. So, if we zoom in, we can see that S21 probably doesn't need tuning, S11 probably doesn't need tuning. The design somehow shift ha upwards in frequency, which is rare, usually they go downwards. Uh, the power is a bit lower than predicted, but it's normal and always typical. We have unaccounted m things like heating up and model differences with reality a little bit and so on. As I said, the Power edit efficiency here simulated somewhat differs at this area. And uh, youth analysis was done on my design at Modelytics, and it probably provides the insight that it could be restored. So this is the next. And you can see with 5% tolerance, Monte Carlo analysis, youth analysis shows that it could be tuned. This was done last week. Uh, I have an idea how probably we can get to a much better solution, but uh, more maybe in when I present this at next forum, <laughs> somewhere else. <laughs> okay, final conclusions. Uh, streamlined practical design method for broadband high efficiency RF power amplifier was presented. The monolithic transistor model with access to the reference plane at the intrinsic generator allows new approach for a shortened process of extracting the fundamental and harmonic impedances for the desired performance. Uh, by the way, it allows you to look at many other reference planes in the input capacity, the feedback capacity. Uh, so this could give you insights also. So that's interesting about this uh, approach to modeling. Uh, and the new approach is to pre-tune the fundamental and the harmonics and impedances at the intrinsic generator to shorten the load pool process. Productivity is also increased majorly by the Amplifier Design Wizard that allows you to synthesize real frequency and real world networks and other automation levels. Microwave Office, of course, everybody knows what it is. Very intuitive simulator. And nowadays with very good accuracy on all simulations. Modulated passive models, of course, are the last part of the puzzle to provide your first time right design process. This is the reference, which these two may remember or not. <laughs> uh, okay, my contact information, maybe you need it. <laughs>